And now on to chapter five. Um, developmental psychology uh, is mistakenly often focused on early development, but as this chapter uh, uh, demonstrates, it's really lifespan uh, development. And uh, whatever part of development you're interested in, uh, I'm getting more interested in aging, uh, it's in here. And it's an interesting, very interesting area. Uh, it deals with uh, lots of correlational things, uh, which means you have to be wicked smart to do it uh, well, and uh, some clever experiments. And uh, the opening vignette uh, depresses me, so I won't deal with that very much. Again, an evil father at work in part of this. Um, so there are lots of important terms here. Uh, developmental psychology, as uh, grows up in ages, zygote, fertilized egg, embryo, early developing in individual, typically a sphere, inner cell mass, uh, the uh, fetus, neural tube, neurogenesis. I, I was quite interested in neurogenesis uh, in, in my research uh, for a while uh, because I'm quite convinced that exercise is involved in neurogenesis in the hippocampus. Uh, cell migration, differentiation, synaptogenesis, uh, neuronal cell death, which sounds bad, but um, it can be part of uh, normal development. And, uh, you know, there's the developing brain, and we have six stages of development on the next page. Uh, and there's again zygote, embryo, inner cell mass, fetus, neural tube, neurogenesis, cell migration, differentiation, synaptogenesis. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. We start off as uh, a single fertilized egg, and then it divides, uh, and it uh, you know the genes in these cells are all the same. Um, and how do you get to cell differentiation? Well, part of it is uh, whether you're on the inside or the outside of the developing ball of cells. So there's the inner cell mass. The body will arise from the inner cell mass uh, and, and the uh, surrounding cells, the placenta. Uh, there's a fetus, uh, weeks 8 to 38. And... Uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing, the developmental process. And we're getting really good at, uh, you know, seeing this process uh, in, uh, in research and uh, in videos. So um, there are the terms, neuro, neurogenesis, uh, you're, develop, you're creating uh, new neurons from the neural tube, and then they migrate out. And having migrated, they differentiate and what they differentiate in, uh, sort of like my story with the cell ball. I mean, if you're on top, you do one thing. If you're in the middle, you do another. If you're on the bottom, you do another. And then you start growing synaptic uh, 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 connections between cells. And you can see layers starting to develop in the cerebral cortex in particular. The uh, layering is very important. Um, and neuronal cell death, um, which, as I said, uh, sounds bad, but uh, within limits, it's part of normal development. And then uh, synapses can rearrange. Uh, and uh, this course is rearranging your synapses as we proceed through it. Uh, and there's a discussion of that. Uh, the, uh, you know, if, if, if something bad happens to 
neural development, particularly early in neural development, it can have a de devastating uh, effect on later, uh, later life and life itself. So these are pictures of uh, different stages and, and two different kinds of neurons. Uh, the top three are in your cerebral cortex. And uh, I, have, I have those on my wall. Uh, and there's a really good artist uh, who does amazing uh, neural art. Uh, I don't usually shake people's hands, but I shook his hand. I was so excited to see him. And then down below was uh, an amazing cell, the Burkinji cell. Uh, I'm not going to test you on this, but um, I mean, look at all those branches. <clears throat> and there are multiple synapses uh, associated with each branch. What's more amazing about the Burkinji is that um, that's like a fan coral. And a fan coral is like a fan. And a fan turned in one direction looks like a stick. And then if you get it in the right orientation, uh, you see the whole fan. Uh, so that's a cerebellar cell um, with huge numbers of synapses. Um, but basically, the dendritic fields are two-dimensional. And there's uh, teratogen uh, that can uh, damage cells. And of course, when you think about damaging the developing nervous system, you can't steer clear of fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, some of my uh, more recent research has de dealt with facial structure and fetal alcohol children. Uh, of course, this is correlational, not, not experimental. Nobody manipulated the parents to make them drink. Uh, but uh, there are characteristic facial changes uh, in fetal alcohol uh, children. And uh, I'm a big believer in uh, the brain and face uh, developing together and that uh, things that can affect one can affect uh, the other. Down syndrome is something else you should think about in terms of characteristic faces and uh, brain development. So these are MRIs down below. And what's really, really, really amazing is on the right, you have uh, a standard brain with a pretty huge corpus callosum, which connects the left and right cerebral hemispheres. And on the left, man, um, there's like no corpus callosum. Uh, it just goes away. Uh, that has to affect uh, behavior. And experience is important. Uh, nature and nurture, sensitive periods. We used to refer to these as critical periods, but critical is a little too critical. Sensitive means uh, you know, you're most sensitive uh, to developmental issues during this period, but other things can affect uh, you too. Uh, neuronal plasticity, which you are exhibiting by learning the material uh, of the course, and I wanted to affect by exercise. Um, the uh, younger brains are more plastic than adult brains, but adult brains are plastic too. If they weren't, you couldn't learn anything. Uh, and synaptic re, uh, uh, rearrangements and synaptic uh, neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, it's all uh, very complex and interacts with uh, the environment. And it's, it's amazing. So then we, we're going through uh, you know, early development, infants and simple reflexes. Uh, the, uh, I remember you know, testing for at least some of these in my children. I don't, I don't know if you would have wanted me as a dad. Um, and uh, there's a range of when things happen uh, during motor development. Some parents obsess over this, which is probably not healthy. Um, and, you know, there's variability. Uh, all humans are not alike. I'll write that down. And uh, SIDS is important. That was a big deal 
they're, they're, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, and we've just had a recall of sleepers uh, for infants uh, because infants are dying in them. Um, and uh, back sleeping uh, seems to uh, reduce the likelihood of SIDS. Uh, it, it does have some developmental effects. Uh, you can you can see uh, it retards things a bit, but the infant is still alive, which is uh, important. Um, and I think we do the visual system next and changes in visual acuity. And there's uh, the visual cliff. Uh, funny story, maybe. The first talk I had to give in uh, graduate school was on the visual cliff. And before the talk, I went into the hall and fainted. Um, I get very stressed by, by public uh, presentations. And there's the classic, man. That is the classic picture. It used to be in all the developmental books uh, in my childhood. So the kid is up there uh, on a checkerboard pattern, and uh, the mom is saying to the kid, hey, come over here. But what the child sees through the glass is, what is she talking about? It's, it's like four feet up in the air. And um, that was my first talk, and I was stressed. And it, uh, you know, human infants tend not to crawl out on the uh, glass. Other animals uh, that can self-locomote once they uh, learn to do that, uh, they don't tend to do it either. Um, it's an important part of uh, growing up. And I know more about the visual cliff than I, I probably should. That, that kid is checking it out, no doubt about it. These studies that are done uh, by early developmental, early development developmental psychologists are so clever. And uh, back in my day, we used uh, this stuff called film that had silver on it. And to make a movie of a child was slow and very costly. Now, of course, we can use videotape and we can track uh, eye movements. So the child is sitting there looking at the targets and through that camera and uh, usually, I think, infrared uh, illumination, we can watch the eyes move between the two targets. And uh, we, we know what babies like to look at. And uh, very clever. Uh, Ithaca College had a very nice uh, developmental psychology lab. Uh, I was jealous. And uh, there's a discussion of the research and what they like to look at. And those are classic targets from, uh, from research, yeah, 1965, and what they like to look at. Uh, and habituation. Uh, kids get bored. Uh, yeah, I've seen it, done it, don't, don't need to look at that anymore. And we use techniques like that, by the way, in uh, rats and mice to uh, test uh, memory. Um, clever, really clever research. And there's researchers at work with different kinds of stimuli. And this is clever. Now, uh, <clears throat> it was originally done long ago where you tie a ribbon to the infant's foot and then connect the, the ribbon to the mobile and uh, the, the infant learns to kick the foot with the ribbon and move the mobile and control their environment and uh, they remember and they remember across time and there's a, a nice discussion of this research where when you test them later you don't connect the ribbon. You just let them lie there and watch which room, uh, uh, leg they prefer to use. In olden times, you'd have to directly motive, uh, uh, observe, observe them or use 
that film with the silver the silver grains, but now of course videotaping makes recording these data uh, very easy. Um, infantile amnesia. Um, I'm always trying to figure out what my first memory was. Of course, it wasn't my first memory. Uh, children uh, who can't even really crawl all that well uh, have memories. Uh, for some reason, my first memory is I was in a crib and I, I decided I could lift myself up to get myself out of the crib. I could just defy gravity. Uh, that didn't work out too well. Uh, cognitive development. This is very clever and very important and critical uh, for good parenting. This is a nice discussion of hyperactivity disorder and uh, with a healthy grain of salt about whether it is a disorder and uh, what we sh should be doing about it. Uh, if you think about humans' evolutionary history, when in our evolutionary history did we take uh, age mates and sit them in chairs and make them sit there for hours listening to someone drone on? That didn't happen. Uh, you did stuff. Um, and part of that concept is in here. And there are drugs that can be used that can help uh, this, uh, this disorder a few. It, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum. Some people do need interventions, no doubt about it. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, my God. I wish I could have grown up to be that cute. Um, I'm an enemy of Freud. Uh, I, I love uh, Piaget. I don't like Freud because he didn't do good science. He didn't give us testable hypotheses. But I'll tell you, man, Piaget did. And he, uh, he worked with his own children, observing them, as I have done, much to their annoyance sometimes. And you have to know these uh, elements of uh, Piaget's theory. Adaptation, assimilation, accommodation, uh, constructivism, really important. And this is not made up baloney, as is the case with Freud and uh, Jung. And uh, we'll see a little bit of baloney later in this chapter. Uh, when I first, I, I reviewed this book, uh, earlier edition, and uh, some of the baloney in this chapter was uh, overblown. In fact, it was the vignette at the beginning of the chapter. I basically uh, said I wouldn't use the book and my peers wouldn't use the book if that uh, baloney was in there. Um, so there's um, a nice summary of uh, Piaget's constructionist view. And it's an interaction. It's, you know, it's like genes in the environment. Uh, we come with certain ways of viewing things and then the environment uh, gives us feedback and we stick with what we believe or we, we move on. And uh, I love these stages. Oh, I, I tormented my children so much uh, on these. And um, so the sensory motor stage, uh, try to imagine being thrown into the world with eyes and legs and arms and auditory systems and trying to figure out how, how all, all this stuff works. Um, so the uh, stages come in, in lawful progression. Uh, object permanence is a good one. And, you know, there's research down below showing an infant without object permanence and one with. And uh, what always strikes me is uh, playing uh, peekaboo with a baby. Man, you know, they'll, they'll be excited by that game uh, as long as you're willing to play it. And that's because when you weren't visible, you were gone. And 
oh my God, he's back. How do they do that? Peekaboo. I, my kids could not get enough of that. Um, this is a little bit more mundane. I like the expression uh, in the last uh, box on A where the kid is surprised because the uh, train comes back because out of sight, out of existence. And um, the, uh, this is a famous test uh, and it relates to egocentrism. Um, young children are very egocentric. Everything is about the world is from their perspective and very <coughs> emotional people, angry, emotional people, uh, they become egocentric too. And unfortunately, some of them have weapons. So the Sally and Ann test, this is amazing stuff. Uh, I, I did, I didn't do this test with my children, but I did something related and it's just stunning. Uh, the children can tell you the ball or that Sally will look for the ball in the box, <laughs> you know, get over it. She wasn't in the room. She didn't see it being moved. How can you believe that? Well, uh, they haven't developed uh, uh, a movement away from strict uh, egocentrism and theory of mind is uh, very big uh, these days. And some of my research uh, dealt with that too. Uh, a researcher in Europe, Leonard Cohen, uh, and uh, it's thought to be related to some forms of alt autism and uh, he's related to another favorite famous Cohen with a mustache that they're cousins. Um, so here we are now in the pre-operational stage, uh, much more cognitive development here. Uh, the theory of mind and uh, passing the Sally and Ann test. So uh, sensory motor, uh, pre-operational, and uh, what pre-operational means will become uh, uh, more clear as we get to the next two stages. Uh, pre-operational, as it says over here, uh, when children learn to use language and to represent objects and actions like using uh, uh, symbols and uh, theory of mind, uh, which uh, the Sally and Ann test definitely deals with. Other people have, may have different uh, perspectives than, than we do. Um, an important box on autism and uh, high functioning autism I certainly have a touch of this, and um, one of my grandchildren uh, at least has a touch of this too. Um, these conservation tests are amazing. I used to wear my kids out with these. So the top one is conservation of volume, which humans are prone to too, uh, which is why uh, uh, people who produce products often put them in tall, thin bottles, so you'll think they're more. Of course, the federal government makes a, them put the number of ounces in there or milliliters, uh, which an adult mind can take and understand much, uh, much better. So uh, in the first box, the, uh, the child sees the two containers and they're equally filled and there's equal volumes, but then right while she's looking, she watches and you pour the liquid from the short beaker into the tall beaker and she will insist that there's now more liquid. Uh, one of my friends, in, or all right, he was a faculty member uh, in grad school, he wanted to prove that uh, 
you could use uh, operant conditioning and reinforcement uh, to teach this uh, before uh, Piaget would say the brain is ready to accept it. So one, as he told the story, one uh, uh, sunny afternoon, he pulled some glassware uh, from the kitchen and lemonade from the refrigerator and he did this. And at first, his son kept saying, well, you know, there, there's more in the tall glass, dad. Uh, and the dad would say, well, where did it come from? You, you saw me pour it from the short glass. And the kid would say, I don't know, but there's more. And he said, OK, I'm going to take this tall glass and pour it back into the original glass. What's going to happen? And the kid would say, oh, don't do that. It's going to spill all over the table because the short glass can't contain that much liquid. And he poured it back and it did not spill. And the kid said, well, it went away. It came from somewhere I don't know where. And as you poured it, it went away. And the father, like, you know, time after time after time, um, did the example, uh, did the demonstration and tried to explain to him that it didn't make any difference. Volume was conser conserved, whether it was a tall beaker or a thin beaker. And finally, the kid just gave up and parroted back to the father exactly what the father wanted to hear. And the father decided that he had defeated Piaget. He had proved uh, Skinner right. And he had dragged his child kicking and screaming to understand uh, conservation of volume. And uh, the kid said, can I go outside now? And as he was going for the door, he turned back to the father and said, I still think it would take you longer to drink the lemonade out of the tall glass. And I bet the dad put his head into the countertop. The kid didn't believe it. He was just parroting. He still thought there was more liquid in the uh, in the tall glass. And this conservation of uh, number is interesting. Uh, you want to steal clay balls or even coins from your children, just spread them out. And because they spread out more, if they don't understand conservation of number, uh, they think there's now more clay. Unbelievable. And there's a related test um, uh, that I did with my daughter uh, involving buttons. And we had red buttons and blue buttons. And my daughter could count up a storm. She loved to count. So I think we had, uh, let's say, seven blue buttons and five red buttons. No, no, let's say uh, maybe three and two. Uh, to keep the math simple. And you show her the five buttons and she would count them. And yeah, there are five buttons. And how many blue buttons are there? Three. How many red buttons are there? Two. And here comes the trick. Are there more blue buttons or buttons? And I still remember being shocked. She said, oh, there's more blue buttons than buttons. And I said her name, which I'll try to suppress. I said, you just counted them. Count them again. How many buttons are there? Five. How many blue buttons are there? Three. Which are there more of? Blue buttons or buttons? Blue buttons. Oh, my God. And I did what my friend did. I tried to teach her. But she was at the cusp of understanding this concept. And she got it. She really got it. She loved it. And this was like the peekaboo game. Uh, it was magic, but now she understood the magic. I swear, she dragged her friends in off the street for like a week, making me show them the button trick. Okay, the button trick. Um, Really amazing. Unfortunately, uh, when parents don't understand these cognitive differences, children sometimes get beaten 
uh, for their deliberate stupidity. I have a story about that too, but I'll, I'll let that go. And now we're into the concrete operational stage, which some of you may still be in. Um, why is it concrete? Because uh, they're very good at logic if it's concrete. Uh, the uh, one test of whether you're concrete or formal is, uh, you know, one of those tests you sometimes see online. How many uses can you think of uh, for a brick? How many uses can you think of uh, for an iron? Uh, it's not how many uses you can think of. Uh, what they do is they manipulate whether they give you a brick. Here you go. Here's a brick. And here you go. Here's an iron. If you're concrete operational, uh, you'll come up with many more uses on average if I give you the object. Uh, uh, whereas if you're formal operational, the next stage, uh, you'll come up with about the same, uh, whether the object is there or not. Uh, concrete operational people are very concrete. They can be very difficult to argue with. Uh, like, you know, children who have trouble with conservation of volume or number, uh, it may not be worth your time. They, they just can't get it. And every time I teach a class, I wonder whether it's ethical for me to require thinking that's formal operational. And uh, I'm doing it. Uh, you can still get an A in the course if you're not formal operational by straight rem memorization. But some of these concepts will be uh, immediately obvious to you if you're formal operational. And um, you really can't do good science without being formal operational. You certainly can't deal with correlational research. You can probably you know, know the rules of experimentation and do that. And there's a graphic, uh, sensory motor, pre-operational with the years, which I haven't been mentioning. Uh, concrete and formal operational. Now, interestingly enough, when they compared uh, Piaget's people, Swiss, to Americans, uh, the Swiss moved uh, along a bit faster, particularly, uh, I think, evident with the formal operational. But look at that graph on the right. I mean, it says that, uh, you know, formal operational 11 to adult. Well, you know, age 14 is a lot more than 11. And uh, still, most people are uh, concrete. And some of you, if you're formal, may remember what it was like in high school uh, to, in effect, be smarter than your teacher. Uh, because your teacher was concrete. And you were formal. And you got things that they just couldn't got. Get. Now, if you're smart, you left them alone. You didn't torment them. Um, but what percentage of the adult population uh, are formal operational? Somebody, uh, or a developmental psychologist at Scranton, uh, did this testing on uh, you, you guys, college students. Uh, I'm not sure the majority were formal operational. Um, and there's uh, temperament, which relates to personality. So what, what am I, I'm sorry, I can't let go of the formal operational. Um, I've given this lecture with examples, and I didn't give you many examples. I've had students come up to me at the end of class crying because they realized they were concrete. You can still become a physician or a teacher if you're concrete. It's just easier uh, to do some types of teaching and some types of uh, science, medicine, if you're uh, a formal. Uh, there was a, a famous television show about physician's house. And oh my God, that guy was for a formal operational thinker. And he just loved uh, solving problems. 
uh, but not everybody was was house. Um, you can be a physician, uh, but you might gravitate in your professional life if you're concrete to things that have rules that don't change. Let me recommend a profession with rules that don't change. Uh, medicine, by the way, is constantly changing now. At one time, medicine didn't uh, change that much. And now we're getting to uh, something that I still wish. Oh, no, uh, stranger anxiety. This is good. Um, I love every Easter where they show pictures of uh, children sitting on the laps of demonic rabbits looking like this. It's not just rabbits. Uh, it's not just rabbits. Stranger anxiety, uh, imprinting, uh, and uh, there's uh, chicks following their mom, and a famous researcher uh, who studied imprinting was Conrad Lorenz, and he was a Nazi, uh, but he won a Nobel, co won a Nobel Prize for in part for his research on imprinting, uh, love and attachment. Uh, Harlow's research is uh, hard to look at. This this picture of following mom, whooping cranes, yeah, they're imprinted, and uh, they need to migrate. And uh, that uh, uh, power glider uh, gets them where they need to go. Boy, uh, that's a, a real deal. And there's uh, Harlow's. Difficult to look at research with research, uh, rhesus monkeys. You know, the wire mother on the right, which provides nutrients, the cloth mother on the left, on the left which does not pro provide nutrients. Uh, even though the baby is being fed by the wire mother, they go to the cloth mother uh, for comfort. Uh, this research would never be done uh, today. Uh, this this is old research. And infant attachment. Um, uh, the snuggly period. Uh, when I had children in the snuggly area, the snuggly goes in the front, a lot of facial contacts, contact. Uh, and the uh, Ainsworth strange situation and different responses to the strange situation. Uh, so be able to describe these forms of attachment, uh, secure attachment, avoidance attachment, ambivalent attachment. Um, this has been you know, pretty well supported and uh, it's related to la later uh, characteristics of children, even into adult uh, adulthood, uh, it's not like it's not written in stone. What's going on here? Uh, the environment definitely can still play a role <clears throat> and change how you uh, turn out. And uh, they're described on this page. And uh, disorganized attachment is another one, not from Ainsworth. Um, and there's uh, styles of attachment, and you know, you know, there's that child from the vignette uh, raging. Uh, so sad that things like that happen. Daycare. Uh, daycare is in the news. Uh, one issue is whether it's uh, part of infrastructure. One thing that tends to be true is daycare workers don't get paid much. And uh, could that possibly affect quality? Uh, I leave it to you to think about it. Um, and uh, here's an interaction of types of attachment and uh, daycare. And uh, that last paragraph is important to me. Uh, as all researchers agree, one key point, the quality of daycare matters. 
And uh, does that mean that society should invest in quality daycare? Well, only if you care about whether your citizens are uh, functional or not. Uh, that's up to you. Some people seem to believe we should let people develop into dysfunctional systems and then punish the heck out of them. Uh, others believe that we should create an environment that reduces dysfunctional behavior. I leave it to you to guess which I am. And there's Jeannie, so sad. Um, some of these vignettes are just painful. Adolescence, uh, the uh, hormones are important. Uh, interactions with self, self, uh, sex hormones. Uh, met, uh, when uh, menstruation starts is relevant. Uh, in Figure Five Two Four, uh, you can see that females are a bit more uh, advanced than males in terms of height uh, development, and uh, we'll see later in this chapter that uh, cognitive development. Uh, is uh, quicker in women as well. So there's uh, years of uh, menstruation across time, uh, definitely going down. And then on the right, uh, you know, graphs again, and uh, the USA is uh, quite early and, and going down um, and uh, different ethnic groups uh, have relatively uh lawful differences what's going on here is not totally clear um one thing that's very clear is not having a uh, dad in the house uh seems to be associated with uh, earlier menstruation of course this is correlational we don't go around stealing dads uh sleep uh you know we set up our schools as if children aren't there i think sometimes um we make children go to school at irrational hours i remember sending my children off to the bus uh when it was fully dark and uh it, it was painful for them to get up and at your age it's it's still true. Uh, I mean, personally, I like teaching 830 classes, but uh, some of you aren't made to do it. You just aren't. Uh, and we should be more concerned about the students and the faculty, I'll tell you. Um, kills me that we, we care about faculty schedules more than student learning uh, sometimes. And uh, these are uh, uh, images of cortical thinning, which sounds bad, but in this case, it's good. And um, it's part of maturation. And uh, the, th the thinning proceeds, uh, I don't know how old you guys are, but uh, you know some of you are in your 20s. But again, if you're a female, you're advanced. If you're a male, uh, your prefrontal cortex is not going to kick in uh, fully until you're about uh, in your mid-20s. So stay chill. Uh, risky behaviors. Um, you know, the best, uh, you know, there's some crime, but boy, you put uh, males and females behind the wheel of a car. Holy cow. Uh, there's the difference. Uh, I'm a big fan of the concept of self-driving cars. Uh, that would uh, go a long way. Look at how the uh, male uh, uh, killed while driving rate starts dropping at around 25. Yep. Your prefrontal cortex kicks in and you stop being crazy stupid. Um, suicide uh certainly a problem in adolescence uh and beyond and uh there's uh data from the national institute of health 
Uh, this is a real issue. Uh, and adolescents have mood swings, uh, males or females. They're trying to deal with hormones they haven't dealt with before. And um, mood swings increase the likelihood of suicide. Uh, most people who try suicide and fail, they don't do it again. Uh, it's, it's not like you're predestined to commit suicide. Uh, it's often an impulse control issue. Uh, you survive the attempt and that's, you know, you still have issues to deal with in real life, but, uh, you don't tend to try to do it again. Uh, which is good. The, uh, sexuality. Oh yeah. I've heard about that. Uh, sexual development. Um, and, uh, uh, gender, the, uh, Dr. Breedlove, uh, deals with this issue in terms of development of the brain, hormones in the brain and differences, uh, subtle differences between male and female brains. Uh, we'll come up with more in information on sexual orientation, uh, later in the, uh, in the in the book uh morality uh we are compelled to learn language uh we we seek out language and i think it's just as real that we seek out uh a moral structure uh in fact research has indicated uh that religions that are relatively lackadaisical in terms of their moral structure, uh, you know, letting people do what feels right to them. Uh, members of those religions can be more, sometimes are more likely to join cults. Uh, they want structure, uh, which is not discussed in the book. It's just, it just tends to be true. Kohlberg uh, was influenced by Piaget. And he tried to develop uh, assays for moral reasoning. Uh, the issue with these uh, moral dilemmas, and I've done research on these too, now that uh, you mention it, um, Heinz and the drug. And uh, the issue is not whether or not uh, you steal the, the drug. Uh, the issue is why. Do you steal or not steal the drug? And he's got stages, pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional. And uh, there they are down below. Two, uh, two stages in pre, two stages in conventional, and two stages in post-conventional. Now, I vote that if you're not formal operational, uh, you're very unlikely to be able to morally function at stage five or six. Um, and uh, there were some hearings in the Senate about uh, someone who worked for a former president who did some things that people thought were bad, but other things people thought were okay. And when you watch those hearings, you could just see that people questioning uh, this former soldier, they were at a, dealing with issues at a higher moral stage. And the uh, soldier was functioning at a lower moral stage and they absolutely could not communicate. Uh, this is very important to understand. And if you're getting into arguments with people about politics or anything, uh, this is an issue. And yeah, you know, like my, my friend and his son and the lemonade, uh, I don't think it's very easy to move people across moral stages. Um, now there's been complaints about Colbert's stages and that they are, uh, a bit sexist, or maybe more than a bit sexist. And, uh, Gilligan is, uh, a researcher who deals uh, 
with some of this this uh, reassessment um, and uh, she has talked about uh, caring and uh, what's good or bad only for me, what's good or bad for other people, what's good or bad for everyone, including me. Um, important stuff, uh, moral reasoning is really important. Uh, I can't imagine living in a society without morality. I just can't imagine it. Uh, moral reasoning should definitely be encouraged. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are states and political affiliations that discourage uh, formal operational from dealing with issues relating to uh, even cognitive uh, reasoning uh, and certainly moral reasoning. Uh, that's probably not good for society. But again, you can't change someone's uh, ability to reason about things uh, very well either. And here's the stuff I don't like, Erickson. Uh, I went to a faculty presentation by someone from the uh, business school, and uh, he said, you know, research on Erickson and individual human beings uh, never works out. It's, it's lousy. But uh, I believe that if you look at societies, Erickson's uh, stages are going to be supported. Uh, Erickson is beloved by sometimes college counseling centers and businesses. Uh, there's a graphic that usually shows up in textbooks, which I encouraged uh, Mark Breedlove to drop from his book, and he did, of a pyramid, uh, you know, where one stage is based on the preceding one. The data are just not solid here. Um, identity, emerging adulthood, um, is there such a thing as a midlife cri life crisis? Uh, still ongoing research on on that. <clears throat> Sorry, um, the aging mind. Hi, welcome to my aging mind. Uh, slows down but continues to grow. Um, and yeah, you know, women have another issue to deal with: menopause. Um, has downsides and upsides, and it's briefly discussed uh, there. And uh, there's a picture of aging, and I'm at the far end of this one. Hearing loss, yeah. Vision, I'm just about to fall off the cliff there. Odor, interesting research here. Uh, if I were teaching this class, you'd find me sniffing and trying to identify odors all the time. And what's interesting about COVID is that uh, anosmia, lack of odor, side effect, that seems to go with, uh, with COVID. Um, for your nose to keep working, as we'll see in the next chapter, uh, you have to generate uh, new receptor cells. And uh, it turns out that if suddenly you don't smell very well, uh, which sometimes leads you to not smell too well to others, uh, you're not developing new uh, sensory cells uh, very effectively. And uh, they are neurons. And uh, if you still smell pretty well, as I think I do, uh the likelihood that you'll be here in 10 years is still pretty good <clears throat> you could ignore covid in that assessment but if you're suddenly unable to smell very well uh bad things may be coming um and one thing that uh the elderly sometimes have trouble smelling is the odorant they put in uh, natural gas uh, so they can fill their homes up with gas 
and die. Um, reaction times, oh, geez, look at that. Um, our reaction time must be going up. Fatality rates, uh, I'm not in my 80s, but uh, that doesn't look good. Again, self-driving cars uh, would fix that. Uh, hippocampal shrinkage correlates with memory decline. Uh, that person has pretty big uh, ventricles. Uh, so, uh, and the uh, hippocampus is uh, not too big in that person. Uh, I hope I'm not there. And uh, this is neat about intelligence. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've read books on intelligence testing, and I'm, I'm a fan. Uh, notice that general IQ test scores are pretty stable across those uh, age ranges. But look at fluid intelligence. Down and down and down. You process things uh, more slowly. But look at crystalline intelligence. Oh, boy, do I know stuff. And I'm still accumulating it. Uh, and there's perceptual speed and vision declines. Not a pretty picture. Uh, a good death. <clears throat> and in, uh, you know, a developing debate in the United States is uh, uh, whether people should have the ability to choose in a calm way. Uh, when to uh, when to die, and uh, that's related to principles of a good death. Uh, if we are lucky, we face aging and the po possibility of Alzheimer's, not Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's. And there's sort of a busy graph here with plaques, and uh, they are debating right now, right this second about whether to approve a new drug that may help uh, slow down Alzheimer's, not stop it, but slow it down. Uh, one of the faculty in the chemistry department used to study this. I don't think he's working on that right now. But uh, bad cells, dead cells, bad. Uh, Alzheimer's is not guaranteed, but it certainly can happen. Um, and it's not a pleasant picture to see your beloved parent or grandparent uh, losing their cognitive abilities and sometimes not even being able to uh, recognize you anymore. It's, it's at least they're, usually they're not in pain. And there's the muse for the chapter, and that's it. For chapter five, there's a lot of terms. Uh, and ah, uh, sensation and perception is the next chapter. That'll be fun. I used to teach that class. Uh, so we'll see you in the next chapter.